yes, uh, governments uh, or, or state they they um, they always try to increase fear and then come as a savior. Yeah, yeah. that is their business model. <laughs> So hello everyone, thank you very much for watching uh, today. I think today's video is going to be maybe one of the most interesting we've had. Uh, I think we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Bagus here uh, with us because he has written with his colleagues uh, an amazing paper which actually links uh, all of the questions that many of us have together. So we're looking at the role of government and big government, we're looking at the links between government and media and the role of media in uh, hysteria, the role of applied psychology, and then some questions of religion and sort of general philosophy as well. So this really is going to cover the entire sort of question of where we are today and how did we get here and what's the role of the government in all of this. So um, I'd let you if, uh, introduce yourself and also mention some of your colleagues because I think what's really very, very good about this paper is because it is multidisciplinary and it covers so many areas. And also the there's 136 uh, research notes. So anybody who wants to dive into any of those enormous range of issues that form part of that paper can click those footnotes and really dive into all of the different angles in this. So um, I'll, I'll, this is the... This is the, a, a um, title from the paper, which you can look up, and I'm going to provide also a link at the end, which uh, you can click on too. So uh, I'll just let you s introduce yourself, Professor Bagus, and your colleagues, and, and go through the paper. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm an economist. I'm pro a professor for economics um, in Madrid and I'm specialized in Austrian economics. My colleagues, uh, Jose Antonio Pena Ramos, he's a political scientist. Antonio Sanchez Bayon is, well, he is versed in many, many fields, in legal, religion, and so on. Also, also e economics. And yes, you are right. The paper is very dis uh, interdisciplinary. And I think it's one of the, well, bad developments in science in general that it has to be it has become too specialized yeah that many scientists are just specialized in a very very narrow field and don't look into other fields and such a phenomenon as uh, the covid 19 crisis has to be yeah you cannot ex understand it fully if you have only very narrow focus and one of the problems is actually that they have given <laughs> Uh, virologists uh, basically is the central command of our societies without taking into account um, other um, <clears throat> other considerations being social economic psychological they only look on their virus thing that uh, it doesn't spread uh, too much but they don't look at any side effects and actually if you ask them they say well i'm only a <laughs> virologist i have no idea about the other thing so um, you have to take an interdisciplinary approach. Yeah, I'm an economist, as I said, but I uh, I read into the psychological literature of mass hysteria, and the idea of the paper was um, to make a comparison: how uh, or what influences the likelihood and the extension of a mass hysteria when it comes to politics, and comparing a minimal state and uh, a modern welfare state. And the conclusion uh, is that uh, a modern welfare state yeah, exacer exacerbates uh, a mass hysteria, makes it more likely and more destructive. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I, that's it's, it's a very interesting conclusion. I think, shall we, shall we go through the different elements then of the, we'll start with the state messaging and the use of fear because i think one thing we've all understood now and and actually still i'm shocked about is the state decided quite early on to use fear as a means to increase compliance with their policy instructions uh, so maybe if we go from there then we'll go into the media side of that and then keep going through the through the um through the links in the chain so yeah, sure. uh, Starting off, I you know this is a, a, an example from England, but I think you had a much more interesting, in a way, 
example from Germany about that paper that was leaked uh, that talked about the use of fear to increase compliance. And, uh, you know, this one is from England, and we're going to do a separate episode about this. But this is also the same idea that you're using applied psychology to is essentially increase fear. Okay, can you say something about the German example that's in your paper, which is, I think, truly shocking, to be honest? Yeah, the paper that was from the Ministry of the Interior, and it was leaked actually already in April 2020. And there the experts recommend the government to instill fear in the population. How? Well, they, they say you should uh, uh, three, three, three things. You should um, emphasize the fear of suffocating. Yeah, the fear of suffocating, dying from suffocation, appears to be a uh, uh, an ancient uh, fear that is in all of us. Yeah, no one wants. It's, it's one of the most horrible yeah, deaths you can imagine. So they recommend, knowing this, they recommend highlighting this that you can die from COVID in this way, yeah. Uh, the other thing that they say you should um, emphasize that there are long-term effects, long long COVID, we all know it now, long COVID, that suddenly, even, you, even though you may have recovered from it, suddenly a few months later, you may just suddenly die, yeah. This also is a way to instill fear and panic. And the third thing, which is, uh, yeah, it, it's just evil, is to say, instill fear in the children. Tell the children that if you, um, if you get infected, uh, it may not affect you, but you, your grandparents may die because of your fault. <laughs> so um, this, uh, these are the three um, uh, st strategies that in this government paper um, were were recomm recommended, and I think all, all three has been executed uh, with uh, great success. Yeah, I mean that's it's a, it's a side issue, but this whole idea of um, uh, this a top down state is basically one solution. And one thing we've seen is no differentiation in the solutions provided. So you know, roping children into this when you know that children thankfully are not uh, are not anywhere near as severely affected as older adults uh, as you said I, I i would agree it's kind of evil to scare those people knowing that they're not actually uh, particularly at risk from the disease yes uh, yeah. governments um, or, or state they they um, they always try to increase fear and then come as a savior yeah, yeah. that is their business model yeah. they are they are always threats sometimes they are they are foreign threats like masses of web masses of uh, weapons of mass destruction yeah, yeah. Uh, that iraq was supposed to have and then this then justifies that the government takes on more power yeah. assumes more power and the population actually applauds, applauds it. Yeah. yeah, They don't resist it, but they actually say, yes, there's a problem, there's a threat, and you government, thank you that you help us, that you take away our liberties, that, that you increase your power. They actually applaud. So this is a very old strategy. The government says it defends us against illness, uh, 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 foreign enemies, uh, poverty, bad education. Here the government comes and solves it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's just, uh, for the benefit of the viewers, just look at one of the images uh, that was out there. This also illustrates, I think it is nice to have an, an image to add to the paper. Uh, you know, this, this image and images like this uh, were sort of sent out 24 seven. In many ways, they're still there, uh, but not as extreme as early in 2020. But uh, the government spent uh, hundreds of millions of pounds uh, on so-called advertising campaigns. Um, and then we can go into the, the mass media, but I mean, it's obvious from pictures like this, if you're bombarded with this kind of image 24 seven, you are going to be afraid. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the human brain 
has a negativity bias. So uh, we focus on negative news, on threats. Uh, this is for evolutionary reasons. Yeah. Uh, our ancestors, if there was the news, oh, there's a lion at, at, at the river, you better focus on this news. <laughs> Uh, because otherwise you will be eaten by it. So, <clears throat> so evolutionary, it, it's clear we, we focus on negative news. But the, the problem is if you if you get it, as you say, 24 hours, seven days a week, it's an enormous amount of stress. Yeah? And this enormous amount of stress and anxiety then is the perfect ground to breed mass hysteria. Yeah? And this is one of the reasons uh, that uh, mass hysteria occur due to this negativity bias. And then, of course, we have, and I think we will talk about it later, this, the media that now is able to bombard us actually 24 hours and also worldwide. Yeah? So we may actually talk about the first global mass hysteria that ever occurred because mass hysteria is very contagious. Yeah? Fear is contagious. Emotions are contagious, but fear especially. So this hysteria, hysteria can spread, and through a global social media, it can spread very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. Well, let's let's um, let's look at the media because uh, what one of the things I wanted to put that advert up was because that creates the very important link uh, that of the money basically coming from the government into into the media. So the UK government has been the number one advertiser throughout this crisis. I, I don't remember whether it was 137 million or 167 million pounds, it doesn't matter, spent on advertising with the media. So can, can you say something about the, the sort of influence the government has over media? And then this is now a new additional lever in this particular situation that they're spending also, I mean, they always spend money on advertising, but in this case, they are now the number one advertiser. Yeah, there, there are many links uh, between the media and the state um, in our modern welfare states. <clears throat> they are co-opted, more or less. One thing is, as you say, the direct advertisements. There are, of course, other things. There's when you um, when you uh, give uh, give the news that the government wants to give to the population, or when you cooperate as a me uh, as a journalist you will get privileged access to information. Yeah. You get a, a good connection to government. It's very important because, uh, especially in a crisis, the news comes from the government. They tell you the, the infectious and the deaths and so on. So um, the, all the news comes from the government. So you want to be in a good relationship with it. Um, of course, there are government uh, media, government television channels, newspapers, or at least uh, co-owned yeah, in Germany, for example, there are many newspapers that are owned by political parties. Um, uh, licensing, yeah, the, the government also licenses radio, TV, yeah, public TV. So there are many connections between the media and the government. And one, of course, is also that uh, the narrative for media also sells very well. Well, there's a huge crisis a huge threat, and here comes the white knight, the government, and saves us. That sells very well. And of course, negative news sell, sell very well in, in general. And finally, we have also to consider that the journalists today are went through maybe 20, 25 years of government education. Yeah. in government universities um, <clears throat> so it's they are close to government uh, there are many studies that there is a leftist bias in in the media that jo journalists vote more leftist or more green than the general population uh, because they have been educated for a longer time in uh, in government universities and of course all these uh, political sciences and journalism or there the professors are very much uh, um, leftist and statist yeah so so the media is very much connected to to the government well i think in or certainly in england as well as there is a new phenomenon uh, this sort of special advisor role which also creates a sort of revolving door 
between government and media where you, you have uh, almost always ex-media people in positions of high influence, uh, but not within the civil sort of not quite clear whether they're in the civil service technically or not, but they're special advisors reporting to ministers. And it creates another link, which is the career path sort of through that revolving door. So, yeah. Yes, in Germany, we have also cases of the revolving door where <clears throat> where top journalists then become um, public relations. <laughs> I mean, officially, the official public relation business of the government, yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, so a lot of links, yeah. and also uh, I don't know uh, if if you've seen as well some some of these um, editorial guidelines coming out from the regulator. I don't remember the exact wording, but they were basically, you know, you will stick to the narrative. This is the editorial guidelines from the sort of regulator of of the media. H have you seen? Uh, no, I haven't seen that. But the yeah. narrative is is, is another point. Uh, if for in Germany, if you uh, if you don't uh, agree, I mean, it's like a huge group pressure in in the media and uh, uh, conformism, yeah, to con yeah. to conform to the to the narrative. And if you don't, you are they they will try to uh, ostracize you. Yeah. yeah, in the media also, you are rightist, a, na a national socialist uh, almost. Yeah, if you yeah. don't subscribe to the narrative and to the to this is actually also a collective narrative no we are here we are, we are a huge community we have to hold together and to do anything that our leaders our Führer says which is yeah. um, to get vaccinated and to comply with with the rules and if yeah. you don't you are ostracized and an a Nazi yeah 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 yeah, let's let's take a quick look then at social media as well. Um, I think you've already said that the you know the big difference now is the speed with which uh, this can become contagious. Uh, fear it, it's sort of instantaneous and global. Um, but uh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask is, you know, I guess some of us had thought maybe the social media, at least in theory, can provide these alternative platforms. But then, you know, here's a screenshot of what happens even in those alternative platforms. Again, if you're, you know, obviously you're not being ostracized from your job because you're not in a job, you're just tweeting or YouTubing or whatever, but then, you know, this is what happens. So that, uh, that's that been a bit disappointing, I guess, would you say? Yeah, the censorship of the big tech has been illuminating. Um, when you, many videos in YouTube are deleted. Yeah, we've had, if we've had uh, deleted videos as well, so. <laughs> I hope this one will not. I hope not um, as well. <laughs> um, and, uh, and even if it's a critical video which is not deleted, below there's always always the the link to the official narrative. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, uh, so there's also this alliance between big tech and and the state, uh, un unfortunately, unfortunately, which uh, leads led to this negative uh, biased. Uh, information which contributed then to anxiety and fear and stress and to the mass hysteria. Yeah, I think I think when we wrap up, you know, we, we'll we'll look at uh, the main conclusion of your paper, which is the big state creates the conditions where mass hysteria is possible. But maybe we should also think about, um, you know, the this sort of we, we've touched it a few times now, the revolving door and those those links now between government and media, government and oh no, private sector media, private sector big tech, private sector pharma. You know, I think this must be an, an angle of, of where, why we're here because those boundaries, uh, I guess now are blurred. I, I don't know if they used to be stronger. Did you used to have a, you know, this is the state, we regulate you, so we're not gonna sort of get into business with you. There's, it's much clearer separation of roles. Yeah, exactly. Um... These three sectors that you mentioned, pharma, big tech, and media, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, they are revolving doors with the government and uh, they are cooperating, unfortunately, to, to such an extent, making this mass hysteria possible. Yeah, okay, well, let's, let's we'll wrap up with that a little bit. Um, and then I want to do, you know, the other thing you said about, I don't want to ask you a couple of questions here, but 
you know, with, with the mass hysteria, you've said that there were, there's always, you know, ways for human beings to get released from mass hysteria and release from fear, exercise obviously being one of them. And the other one is socializing. And I, you know, your paper points out that those, you know, those were the things that were sort of restricted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because as I said, the stress and the anxiety, this is the ground for the hysteria to develop and to spread. Um, but of course, there are also, so, and this may actually happen in a free society or in a society with the minimal state, that there's like a threat and people overreact to it, uh, or the threat is even no existing and there's fear and it, it, it is contagious. But uh, it always ends at some point and there are counter, uh, counter effects, which, uh, which reduce the stress level, which is one is physical exercise, as you said, this was um, uh, made uh, more difficult or even ruled out. In Spain, for example, it was not possible to go running for outside for several months. Uh, so no exercise at all. And socializing, of course, also um, seeing, uh, seeing others' faces, smiling also reduces stress. I mean, th these face masks, these uh, uh, increase stress also. Yeah. Um, because you cannot see the face of the other person if he's smiling or not. There's so much uh, nonverbal uh, communication, which is important for a social interaction, um, normal social interaction. If, and if it's, this is disturbed, um, then stress is increased. Yeah, the loss of control. If you have the feel feeling that you lose the control of your life, yeah, which many people had. Uh, because because we lost control and the yeah. government took over. Uh, this increases psychological stress. Uh, and um, having fun, yeah, having fun and uh, pleasure. <laughs> yeah. uh, socializing, but also yeah, uh, going out to drink, have fun, uh, do sports with others. All of this was um, through lockdowns was um, forbidden. Yeah, were denied to people. And this, this contributed, of course, to, to the stress level and anxiety, which then made it more likely for mass hysteria to develop. Yeah. yeah. And just one other thing also, I'm not an expert in this area, but on the isolation, uh, I think that makes you more malleable uh, and you can, be, you can be easily, more easily manipulated and sort of programmed if you're, if you're isolated. It's... So not only do you not get the stress relief, but you actually put yourself in a position where you're more vulnerable to sort of messaging, I guess, if, if I could call it that. Yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> uh, this is what you do, or what if you do what brainwash, brainwashing, this is what you do with the prisoners of war and the Korean War, when um, American prisoners of war, they were basically isolated, Yeah. If you get isolated uh, and you cannot uh, interact with others uh, and, so, so to speak, testing your opinions with others and the, you get a response, then, uh, yeah, you, oh, you're almost driven crazy. And then if you're then bombarded always with the same message and propaganda, yeah, the North Koreans actually managed to brainwash some American prisoners who then went publicly on TV, denouncing their own government and capitalism you know, through this strategy of loss of control, isolation, <clears throat> and continuous propaganda. Yeah, so. yeah so that's it's sort of a double, a double problem being isolated. You, you, you lose the stress relief and you make yourself more vulnerable then. Yeah, because, and we were bombarded always with the same news. Yeah. yeah. So. Let's... Um, Let's talk about maybe two things. Um, uh, th this, this is one in the same theme. And then I wanted to also ask you, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but I wanted to ask you about the incentives and the way the incentives are skewed to, towards creating panic. And you touched on at the beginning, but I, I wanted to ask you about religion and I don't want people to flick off here. I don't think we're talking about religion as an a particular kind of religion, but a general belief in a higher power uh, that that always, I think, in your paper you mentioned it. It gives you a different sense of perspective, and also will reduce your fear of, let's say, a virus, because you have 
another time horizon and another end end point. So can you say a little bit about where religion is in, in this mix? Yeah, <clears throat> one important thing is to understand that the welfare state has uh, driven out uh, relig religion to some extent because the welfare state has to taken over um, functions that churches or religion um, fulfilled uh, in the past, like helping in your commun community, um, <clears throat> getting support, spiritual, but also material. Um, uh, so the welfare state is taking taking this over, and there are empirical studies that show the more welfare spending, the less role of uh, religion in a society, uh, the less role of the of the churches. So um, there's a connection between the increase of the size of the state, the welfare state, and the decrease of religion. And now um, there are also studies that show that religious people or people that are spiritual, uh, to some extent at least, that they have less. Uh, psychological problems or le are less vulner vulnerable, at least. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, with the decline of religion, I, I, I think po the population has become more vulnerable to mass hysteria, to psychological problems in, uh, in general. And then there's, of course, there the question uh, of uh, what happens after your death. Yeah. Uh, if you're religious, if you uh, believe uh, in God and you think that there's a life after death, then it's not an end. So you, are, uh, you don't have to panic so much as if you think uh, it all ends when you, when you are dead. Then the, the fear of death in a, a religious society tends to be higher. Yeah? And if, you, if you, such a society where the fear of death is much much more pronounced than <clears throat> then uh, it's much more likely for mass hysteria to develop and get out of control yeah. yeah and that's certainly a condition we have had as you said a retreat of and uh, you just wanted to say to people this isn't a particular church or even an organized religion it can be any generic uh, ideas about a higher power and any kind of thinking about a, a recycling of a person at the end of his life is just so much less fearful than that you know what comes at the end because for many people it's just a new iteration ahead so so as you said it's another condition it's a lot of conditions we have for mass hysteria i guess it's not surprising that we, that's where we are beginning to get to um i i'm not going to go through this uh, but i'm just gonna ask you um you know the 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 skewed incentives for uh people in the government you know c can you say a few words uh, how, how that works as well yeah so if there's the threat and uh, you don't know um how big it is yeah, you can overreact or underreact as a politician if you underreact to it um you will have bad news immediately. Yeah. And, and at the beginning, there was this pictures of Bergamo where you see the, the dead cases, uh, bodies. And uh, so as a politician, you don't want to have that in your country. And you don't have, want to have these pictures of people in the uh, intensive care unit. <clears throat> um, so um, you rather... You, because then you will not get reelected. You will be ousted of, out of power. If you overreact to the threat, what will happen to you? Well, um, maybe people will die in five years' time due to alcoholism that they developed through lockdowns. There may be divorces. There may be suicides. But they cannot directly connect it to your overreaction, to your lockdown. Or it's very difficult to connect it, and it's only in the future, maybe when you're already out of power. Yeah, I mean, or living standards fall uh, in the third world, and therefore mm, children die. So it's very indirect link. Yeah? Or or people <clears throat> do less sports, and therefore they will uh, die earlier in ten years' time. So it's. Uh, these indirect effects cannot be related to you. And you can, of course, always say, if you overreact, you can, I mean, this is what they say. If we would not have done it, 
Yeah. If we would not have done the lockdowns, then yeah. millions of people would have died. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but if they underreact and they, they get the pictures of the dead bodies, this is immediately uh, bad news for them. So the incentives for them is to overreact. And of course, the costs, they don't bear the, bear the costs because the costs, they can be externalized. Yeah, if uh, Merkel uh, instituted a, a lockdown, large part of the costs are borne by other people, which are locked up, which uh, have uh, uh, loss in their income, their health, their psychological health deteriorated. All these costs is not borne by her. So why should she care? Yeah, I mean, we, we can park this question, but uh, there's also the flip side of the question. While we, we have criticized rightfully the government, uh, the question is now also for people, uh, you know, are, you, are we prepared to allow allow people to make a sort of decision with a ten year horizon, or are we as people also insisting, you know, we don't want Bergamo full, we don't care what happens in five years time. I, I wonder how much how much are politicians leading versus following here. Are there enough people uh, to say, look, let's take a ten year or twenty year view on this and let's do something that makes sense in the long term. Uh, yeah, I guess this is uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the workings of democracy. You know that you want don't want to have to, uh, or you you automatically don't have a long term view. It's only up to the next elections, and uh, people, um, most people uh, prefer it. And uh, and of course there was there was much fear, and nobody. Yeah, I mean with emotions you can. Uh, I mean, it was not a. It was never a rational discourse, a yeah. rational open discourse where we had actually two positions that were both considered to be legitimate. Yeah. Of course, if you would say, "Well, lockdowns have all these bad side effects," well, the other party shows the picture of Bergamo, yeah. and then you have lost the discussion, the debate. It's yeah. over. You have nothing to say. Yeah. So. Uh, so what is what is the consequence or what can we deduce from this? I think is it's a very, very dangerous institution to have such a welfare state, such a big state, because if such a mass hysteria develops, the destruction that for society in all possible on all possible levels, on the social, on the psychological, on the economic, on the health level, is the destruction is is tremendous, yeah. Because bad bad decisions can <clears throat> will then be triggered by this irrationality in this uh, hysteria, um, and these bad decisions have uh, awful consequences. Something that would not happen with a minimal state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you said, it's a vicious circle. You you start the fear off that turns off your rationality, and and it just goes on from there. Basically, there's no. There is no room for that discourse. What makes more sense over a ten-year horizon? Because essentially, your rational thinking has been switched off for many people, and you are in the hysteria. Um, I, I'm not going to comment on this chart, but I was looking for another one, which was people's estimation of of the dangers of COVID, and they were a hundred, a thousand, fifty times higher than the real numbers, and that was such a good. Uh, you know, you can see the result of this fear campaign that people have completely got this at completely out of proportion and, and no real understanding of what the threat of this disease really is or was. Yeah, that is a mass hysteria that you overestimate yeah. the threat. Yeah, you basically act as if it would be Ebola, but it's not Ebola. It's uh, the, your survival rate if you're if you're not old is 99 more than 99 percent yeah 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 good so i think that's i mean to me it's uh, it's been really fascinating to hear all of those different elements that i think you know putting it together all of those elements you're saying uh, in a big state society have combined to get us into a state of mass hysteria which would be much much less likely with a with a smaller state is that yeah, so the idea is how can we, what can we do that this will not repeat itself? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, constitutions uh, will not 
do, uh, I mean, constitutions supposedly are to protect uh, citizens against uh, the government, yeah. but they did they did not fulfill this role. Yeah, if this was their purpose, they totally failed. So constitutions <clears throat> are not uh, are not the the way to go. What I recommend, or I I think the conclusion is that the size of the government has to be redu reduced. So the connections to the media. Yeah, uh, should not be uh, totally separated the media from the government, uh, from big tech, of course, also from ph pharmacy. Uh, there should be no uh, influence of the government in, in, in healthcare because this is another point <clears throat> that we make in the paper. If you have an auth authoritative source like the government, which is responsible for public health, and this authoritative source told you with the poster that you showed, don't go out because you kill other people. Then you, you, you tend to believe. Yeah, if you have this one uh, chief prized uh, Anthony Fauci, for example, in the US, and this has so much authority and he speaks out of this whole holy uh, halls of the Congress, US Congress that no one can, can walk into normal people. So it's like a holiness. That, uh, and from there he says, well, there's this killer virus. Okay, then you believe. If, if government would not be responsible for that, if this would be private, there would be many independent specialists about public health, about health issues, which would compete with, with each other. And one would say, this is a very killer virus. Other would say, no, don't, don't, uh, don't freak out, don't panic. It's not uh, just uh, act normal, more or less. Take some uh, 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 some measures. But when you get all this power to the government, then this measure, message of fear can really overwhelm you and lead to the panic. Yeah? So the conclusion is get government small again or eliminate it so that uh, all, uh, all the factors that contribute to the mass hysteria uh, are reduced or even eliminated. Yeah. And just just closing up, I wonder, you know, that's obviously a call for libertarianism. You know, does libertarianism have enough momentum behind it to to do that? Because because obviously the main parties have all been involved in all of those problems that we spoke about. So I think realistically, you know, what you're suggesting to roll back government is is going to be essentially a, a libertarian movement uh, which will have to sort of i guess clash a little bit with the established parties is there enough is there enough momentum to get any progress with those things or will these unhealthy relationships stay in place well it is an up, it's an uphill battle of course because government controls education the media um, <clears throat> however um, we can also look on the positive side a huge part of the population in this crisis has stopped to believe in government. Uh, they have become more skeptical and they come from all political backgrounds. Yeah, I mean, because the lies of, gov of government, what they told about the vaccine, about the, <clears throat> about the, about the th threat and the harm they actually did uh, to people, that people can f feel it, uh, the, the power of government. And, and people, people, many people want their liberty back. Uh, they want liberty. So uh, in this sense, there's one positive thing of this crisis that many people start, started to distrust government and become more liberty-minded. Uh, liberty so uh, hopefully this hopefully. can produce momentum. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's for, what we're for here liberty. for, I think. That's why we spend the time. And, uh, you know, again, I'd, I'd like to thank you for the enormous effort that, that's gone into that paper. As you said, the, you know, the cause is really a libertarian cause to try and get us back on a, on a more healthy track uh, of a better structure of society without this uh, government overreach. And as you said, if anything, this crisis, I think, has certainly woken uh, quite a few people up to the dangers of a of a over over powerful state basically yes so let's as you said let's hope that that process continues and uh, 
some of these uh, important issues you've raised can be can be resolved going forward so yeah yeah let's hope so we'll do our best okay <laughs> Well, thank you for that. That's fantastic. I'm just going to put up here at the end the link to the actual paper. So uh, that's the link to the paper. Hopefully you can see it. I will put that up on the website. Yeah, I really strongly recommend that really everyone watching this uh, gets that paper, reads it. It's well written. It's relatively short. It's obviously uh, a, a short summary of an enormous amount of work. And as I said, with the footnotes, you can dive into any single aspect that we've touched on today to get more information. Um, and everybody should be reading this and uh, hopefully working together to rectify some of those problems that we went through today. So thank you very much, Professor Bagus. I think this uh, very fascinating interview. Uh, I, think, I thank you, Mr. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thanks. Bye.